it speaks to the miracle of podcasting and the fact that you really never know who is listening. And if they like what you're doing, it's they're going to invite you to very unique experiences. Money is a technology, right? And it does a lot of good things. But as my grandfather used to say, right, if you pile it all up, he said it's a lot like manure. If you pile it all up in one space, it stinks to high heaven. If you spread it out, it's a wonderful fertilizer. <laughs> the right information can literally like build a fortune. Munger or Buffett saying that you know, a $20 book could have a billion dollar idea in it and you never know which one it is. So just keep yeah. reading. One of my hypotheses is we're moving from mass markets to mass customization. The way society is set up pushes people to specialize so much. I try to go way harder in the reverse direction and do exploration as a service. I don't think you build a great company or a great life for that matter without having persistence. If you type www relentless, you go to Amazon. Find people you're interested in and read their biographies. I promise you, I really believe with every bone in my body that it like, will, will feed your mind and it'll nourish your soul. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another Infinite Loops. I just, my cup runneth over. Today, I have two of my favorite people as guests. And this came out of some feedback that Liberty received from uh, someone talking about the three people he would love to see on a podcast. And it even came with pre-selected uh, questions from this listener. So this <laughs> is a listener-generated podcast. My guests are David Senra, the rock star, apparently, of podcasting with his Founders Podcast, which is part of my son Patrick's Colossus Network. And one of my other favorite people who always shares amazing ideas with me, Liberty, with the initials RPF, right? Like, let's Richard P. Feynman. So welcome, guys. Thank you for doing this with me. The, the thing with you guys, man, is what I should do is just hit record before you even come on, because we are 30 or plus minutes deep in what was an incredible conversation. And I'm thinking to myself, I should be recording this. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. For yeah, maybe that was the best part. Maybe it's all downhill from here. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, you're now, I, I've been on that ride. Uh, so I, I know how that goes. Uh, let's see, though. I think we're going to keep it interesting because David told us both something that we want him to talk about because it's going to lead to another part of our conversation. So, David, you had lunch with a mystery guest. Uh, tell us the story because it's incredible. So one of the things that all three of us share is that we love podcasts. We describe podcasts as miracles, and that's really the way I think it is. And one of the miracles about podcasts is like you never know who's listening. Like even meeting you, where I go on Patrick's show, um, you like it, you listen to it twice, and then a few hours later, you're like, Patrick, put me in a, in a group chat with him. I need to talk to David. And then now we've become friends, and like we had this super long lunch in Miami uh, like a few weeks ago or whatever. We talk all the time, and then you, and you invite me on your podcast again. So that's one example. But the other example is like, you know, sometimes you get these weird, um, you know, messages and you can't tell if like they're actually true or not. And so I did a, a podcast on Sam Zell's autobiography and I get a message from a guy that's listened to my podcast for years. And he's like, hey, I've known Sam for two decades. He's been a mentor of mine. Um, you know, he's been invaluable and in, like steering me in my career. He's always like asking for information. So I send him books and articles and he loves podcasts. So I sent him a bunch of your episodes. He listened to them. He loved them. And then when he heard the episode that you did on his autobiography, he asked if he could meet you. And so I was like, shut up. Like, there, this is <laughs> fucking fake. Like, because I had never met this guy in person yet, right? I was like, I was like, yeah. He's like, he's like, Sam's in Miami all the time. I live here too. Would you be willing to have dinner with, lunch or dinner with him? I was like, yeah, okay. If Sam Zell is going to come, of course I'll have dinner with him. I thought it was bullshit. Like a week or two passes by. He's like, okay. He's coming to give a speech at this conference on this day. Uh, can you, are you available that day? I'm like, if this is Sam Zell, there's nothing else on my fucking calendar. Like, yes. I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking about? The guy fucking sold his company for $40 billion. No, no. Like, yes. Why the fuck would he even want to talk to me? And so then like, you know, a couple of days later, he said, okay, meet at this, at this restaurant at this time. I'm like, oh my God, this my, and I didn't tell anybody about it. And so I told my wife the day up, I'm like, listen, I'm going to this lodge with Sam Zell. Here's my location in case I get kidnapped. Like, there's some crazy shit that could be happening here. So I show up early with the guy that's been listening to my podcast for a long time. 
we talk for like 45 minutes, maybe an hour before Sam gets there. We got there on, on purpose early, like to get to know each other. And then we're, he's in the middle of telling me this crazy story because he's got an interesting career too. And then he's looking over my shoulder. He goes, oh, there's Sam. And so I turn around and it's fucking Sam Zell. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck is happening? What is my life? And originally I thought, I was like, oh, maybe this is gonna be like a lunch with like a bunch of pe people. Like, you know, Sam's hosting lunch and he invited me and like, I won't actually get to talk to him, you know? It's like, no, it's me, this other guy and Sam. And Sam sits directly across from me. And for fucking two hours, I have essentially like a conversation looking deep in his eyes hear a crazy fucking story after crazy story. He is exactly like, if you've ever heard him speak, he's exactly like that. Talks like, talks shit, unfiltered, loves what he does, still doing deals. He's like, I'm going to do this till I fucking die. Crazy fucking stories from, you know, six decades, six decade long career. And what was crazy is how many questions he asked me. Just like when I met with Jim, I'm like, Jim, you're a legend. Like, I just want to talk to you, dude. Like, I want to hear like the shit that happened, like your fucking experience, right? And Sam's like obsessed with podcasts. It's like, uh, why did you start a podcast? How do you start a podcast? What's the business like? All these fucking questions. I'm like, oh, this guy, exactly who he was in his book when he was 20, 19, 20 years old, trying to start a company, trying to get access to good information. He's been like that forever. And he's going to be like that forever. And so really, I'm happy I got the opportunity. It was amazing. Um, but really, I do think it speaks not to me. Like it speaks to the miracle of podcasting. And the fact that you really never know who is listening. And if they like what you're doing, it's, they're going to invite you to very unique experiences. And it, it just, it was just a remarkable day. It's a day where Sam will probably not remember it, but I'll probably remember for the rest of my life. And he gave you a single line of advice that you don't need, but I would like you to repeat it for our listeners and viewers. He said it like five or six time, times. And I actually got to tell you a story because I heard the greatest compliment I ever heard that somebody I, I feel could give you. I spent half a day uh, with Jeremy Giffen and David Perel, like a few, like a couple of days ago. They're huge fans of you. They were there when you like held court at Capitol Camp. They said you like fucking gave like six hours of stories or some shit. <laughs> like we can talk about that later. Um, so I'm talking to Sam about like you know like you're super wealthy, like unbelievably wealthy, but like you're having fun, like you like you're enjoying it. And he repeated this over throughout the conversation. He said it like five or six times. He's like, go for freedom optimize for freedom he's like it's all he, freedom everything comes down to his freedom he's like if you get the freedom you can control what you do every day you'll love it and if you love it you'll do you'll be very good at it and then the money will come with it but he's like i never chased money i chased freedom and the freedom got me the money hmm. and and then he talks about like he talked about you know like he meets a lot of rich guys that aren't having fun and he's like he still has fun he's like riding his motorcycle he's traveling all over the world and i'm like sam why are you giving these speeches like you don't have to fucking do this he goes it's an obligation for me to share with other people what I learned. And so what made me think of you when, I, when he was talking yesterday was um, I talked to Jeremy and David Perel. They, I met them through the podcast, right? And they were just saying, like, they were singing, like, your praises, right? Um, and Jeremy said something that was very interesting because for the last 10 years, he's still relatively young, but for the last 10 years, he's, like, been buying businesses, leading investments. He was working at Tiny, and he's met a bunch of rich people. And he's like, he's like, you know, essentially just meets billionaires and hundred millionaires and all these people all the time. And he's like, the, he goes, I, I fucking love Jim. He goes, cause he goes, Jim's a rich guy that's having fun. And you could tell he's having fun. And I was like, I, I'm going to save that for the podcast because like, that's the best. Cause I, this is after we had our lunch and your whole thing was like, why is venture capital called venture capital? It used to be called adventure capital. That's a better name. Like I'm going to fucking do OSV as adventure capital. And then your whole thing is like, I'm not doing this shit to add another zero to my fucking net worth. He's like, I'm doing this because it's fun. And like, yes, I probably will make money, but that's, I'm optimizing for fun. And that's exactly what Sam is saying. He's like, I optimize for freedom and I only do shit that's fun. You know, uh, I, Liberty, I'm going to bring you in because you're somebody who I admire greatly, as you know, and, and you've optimized for freedom. And I want to get your, your take on that. But as far as the optimizing for something else, right? So I was telling you guys before we started recording, like I, because I was in asset management for 35 years, right? Um, A, I never went into asset management because I wanted to get rich. I was absolutely obsessed by why Wall Street worked the way it worked. 
And like, I just would, you know, I just kept going down the rabbit hole and say, but where is this? Where's the proof? Like, where's the proof that you hear? Because this is back in the dark ages, guys, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you, you golfed with your portfolio manager and that's how you picked him or her, right? And back in those days, it was a him. And like, <laughs> you, you, you were golf buddies. And like, I was at a dinner, right? And, and all of the older people were arguing about IBM. And like, I'm listening and it's kind of like, it was all about the CEO and I'm, and I'm kind of sitting there going, don't you even wonder like what, how much you have to pay for every dollar of earnings or revenue or whatever. And like that just obsessed me. Right. And, and so the thing I want to share though, is like, I've had the opportunity because of my career to meet a ton of rich people. And as I was telling you guys. I can count on, and for our video viewers, you'll see that I'm only holding up eight fi uh, fingers and thumbs here. Out of hundreds, I can tell you that only about eight, when I asked them, so, you know, what, what was your passion? Only eight said, I wanted to get rich. <laughs> All of the others of the hundreds of people that I spoke to, their eyes lit up and they talked about whatever passion made them rich, right? It was not, I want to be rich. It was, I want all of the, as you point out, go for freedom. I want it to be able to, you know, up, my obsessive curiosity drove me into doing this. And, and so like, that's such a great life lesson as far as I'm concerned, right? It, it, people, people get it all mixed up. In my opinion, money is a technology, right? And it does a lot of good things. But as my grandfather used to say, Right. If you pile it all up, he said it's a lot like manure. If you pile it all up in one space, it stinks to high heaven. If you spread it out, it's a wonderful fertilizer. <laughs> right. So, so I mean, that's something we'll, we'll, we'll jump and explore a little bit more because I know you have some great ideas on it, David, but so do you, Liberty. And you've optimized for freedom and for doing your own thing. Talk, talk a bit about how you decided, you know what? I really need to optimize for freedom as opposed to, and, the infinite other things that you can optimize for. Yeah, yeah, I try. Uh, it's never something that you can get perfect at, but it's a kind of a direction that you point to, right? And I think Sam's advice about freedom is, like, it could sound cliche to some people, but it's not about knowing about it. It's about doing it. And so few people actually do it, right? I, I, and I didn't pick the name Liberty randomly, right? It's, 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 it's been a long time that I figured out, like, the old adage of know thyself, right? Once you figure out kind of who you are, what makes you happy, I've realized that it's, it's all about like freedom and control of my time and, and you know, the, the things that Cal Newport writes about, right? What makes a great job? Well, it has autonomy, creativity, and impact, right? If you can figure out something that has, has those things, you have a much better chance of being happy, one of, being one of those people with the eyes lighting up when you, they talk about what they do, rather than if you try to optimize for money, the overnight success takes so long, right? It takes so long to get to the point where you do have money that money in itself is not a good enough motivator to get you there, right? And so most people who have these kind of goals, after probably not even years, right? They, 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 they give up way before then. While if you have something else that really motivates you, I think that's the only way to get there. And, and, and David, the story is so great. And I have to ask you, right? You've read much about Sam Zell. Did you, going in, did you feel like you already kind of knew him? Or did you have a massive update to the model, right? Because a book can only convey so much information about a person. So I'm curious, and I wish you could meet many more of uh, the people whose book you've read about so you could kind of, uh, I don't know, figure out who's kind of how they, they are being portrayed at and who's totally different because some of them are probably not how they, they, they appear in books. I had read the book and then watched when I, like before I met him, I was like, watching a bunch of his speeches and there's a bunch of stuff on uh, like YouTube about Sam. Um, and so I had, especially with an autobiography, like his autobiography is written in his voice. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't ask him if he had help or, you know, some people have other people help write or ghostwriter or whatever, but the way it, the way the, the, he comes across in the book is exactly how he was in person. And so when I got home yesterday, I was like, I told my wife, I was like, I want that. Like, I want to be 81 still doing what, loving what I'm doing, just like still curious about the world, still asking questions. Like if you think about anybody that could only be focused on themselves, 
could be somebody like Sam Zell. This is like, you know, got more money he could ever spend. He, he's got his own private jet, do whatever he wants, but he's curious about other people and other things going on. And so where we first connected, when he first sat down, I was like, all right, listen, I don't know how much time I got at this guy's, but his time is very valuable. So I'm going to come out swinging. And so I go, listen, Sam, what I noticed about your book is like, you start telling the story about your father, you know, uh, escaping Poland when the Nazis are coming in, his family literally escapes in the last train out, right? Most of Sam's family did not listen to his father's advice. His father was like a grain trader, or something like that. So he was getting intel all over Europe outside of Poland. So he was, this is really important. I'll, I'll tie this all together. And so his father was getting, he was actually hearing what the Nazis were actually doing. Not what they were saying, right? But hearing, oh shit, they're going around killing Jews. Well before, this is like in the 30s, right? And so he, he gets this information. He's like, he's telling the rest of the family, like, we got to get the fuck out of here. We have to leave. And the other members of his family did not have access to that information. And so therefore did not believe him. And so even though he was, I think he was 34 years old at the time, his father's 34 years old, married with a two-year-old daughter. And uh, because Sam was born like 90 days after uh, they arrived in America. So pregnant, right, with Sam. And he takes off. He leaves. leaves his, uh, he's like, please come with me. His family doesn't come with me. And then, he, he, so he winds up escaping. It's very difficult uh, endeavors, you can imagine. Gets to uh, the country and, you know, builds a site and then tells Sam the whole time he's growing up. He's like, you don't I believe how lucky you are as you were born in America. You have no idea. And they talked about, she, he was watching videos when he was six years old of Jewish bodies in fucking dump trucks. Dead bodies that the Nazis killed in dump trucks. He saw that at six. And so I go, Sam, here's the weird thing. Like, your dad was voracious for information that saved his life. And yet, when you tell the story of you being a teenager, a young man, because he started his company, he's like, you know, 19, 20, 20 years old, voracious for information. I go, is that the same thing? Like, it, the same concept. It's like, oh, I know how valuable information is. It can literally save your life. In an entrepreneur or an investor's case, the right information can literally, like, build a fortune. And he's like, it's the exact same thing. Ah. It's, it's the, the right idea, the right time, right? I think it's, was, was Munger or Buffett saying that you know, a $20 book could have a billion dollar idea in it and you never know which one it is. So just keep yeah. reading. Yeah, I, I, I remember that as a Tom Peters quote, uh, but a slightly uh, variant where he says, you know, if I pay $25 for a book that I get one great idea from, the, the, the return I, on investment that I'm getting is stratospheric, right? Yeah. And, and, but I want to, I want to continue going down the, uh, the path of David, uh, Liberty, you guys both are wonderful at seeing similarities, differences, et cetera, in not only people, but companies, et cetera. But one of the things that, as I think about this, right, like desire for freedom. Yeah. Check. Um, passionate and insatiable curiosity right? Like those two together just seem to me to be almost kind of like, a, a, if you guys really want to have a great life, at least have these two. What would you guys add to that list? I, I think it's a great fuel. It's a great starting point. I feel like most people specialize way too much, right? I've, I, we've talked about that before. I feel like one way to get out of that trap is to start creating stuff. And as soon as you start being creative, you, you don't have, you don't have a choice to explore more to, to, because ideas are all kind of connected and finding a great idea. Well, it won't come to you at first, right? You have to try a bunch, you have to iterate it. So as soon as you start making something and it could be anything, right? It could be something in your backyard shed. It could be a blog. It could be music, something with your kids. But as soon as you start really getting into something, going deep into it, you, you kind of don't have a choice but to explore and to start uh, expanding your horizons. And the more you, the more you learn, the more you realize what you don't know. Right? Every door you open leads to three new doors. And like in the same way that David has talked about, like every book he reads, well, it leads to three other books or whatever, because you know something is mentioned somewhere or in in the bibliography or you know, something else by the same author. Like everything is connected. Well, as long as you stick to the same little silo, the same little thing every day, you relive the same day over and over again. I don't know, that, that, that feels so limiting, right? Uh, I feel like for everyone out there, your very favorite thing in life is out there and you haven't found it yet, right? Just, just it's so sad for those that don't explore enough, that, that don't stumble upon it. 
right? Um, it's a way to make your life so much better. And uh, I don't know, I feel like like the way society is set up pushes people to specialize so much that, I don't know, I, I, I try to go way harder in the reverse direction and, and, and do exploration as a service. I, I, I like this, this is my new expression now. I try to provide exploration as a service and okay, maybe you don't have time to, you know, spend all day looking through stuff, but I, whatever I find interesting, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. Yeah. I, and I love that concept. As you know, you and I have talked offline about that a lot. And I, I personally believe that, uh, the ability to curate all of this crazy information, uh, is going to be like, it's going to be a great occupation going forward. Because, you know, like we're all way over our Shannon limits, right? There's just <laughs> so much. But, you know, to be a curator, you've, you've got to have pretty good taste. And so that gets right back to the individual. I think one of my hypotheses is we're, we're moving from mass markets to mass customization. Hmm. And, and so there's going to be all of these non-obvious career paths that people wouldn't even think about just a few years ago that are going to become available to people who understand the power of these, these tools. David, I, I want I want you to add to the list though, because as both of you know, like I can't help it. I build algorithms in my head, like as, as I'm listening and like, I'm just like, Ooh, I might be able to come up with a heuristic as to finding like the next great, uh, the next great founder. What, what, what else would you add, David? So in addition to freedom, and then, you know, this obsessive curiosity or the, like get, working yourself into a position where you, you're working in a field where you have an intense interest is the way I think about it. It's persistence by far. Like that's mm -hmm. a, the next most important thing. I just did this um, podcast on Ralph Lauren that is becoming really popular. People seem to enjoy. And one of the things about him that's so remarkable is, first of all, he found, Liberty was just talking about like how sad it could be if like people never find what their life's work should be. Or in many cases, they aren't even trying to like, like even find it, right? Ralph was very unusual. He found his life's work when he was like 20 and he's 83 and he's still doing it. So what's fascinating is that the book that I read though is very old. It's like 35 years old. The company's only 20 years old at the time, still massively successful. You know, he's one of the richest self-made uh, Americans at the time. I think his company is in like $2 billion a year in, in revenue, you know, in the 1980s. So it's like very, very good. But this obsession and persistence where everybody around him is like, Ralph, why are you so obsessed? Like he was a tie salesman. And yet he'd go and, and talk to tailors and people selling like menswear, uh, like suits and stuff. And he'd talk to them for hours about belt loops and the, the, and, and we had the placement of a pocket. And they're like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? He was such an eclectic person that four years before he started his own company, there's this trade journal it's called like daily menswear. Or I can't remember the name, but he had dressed so unique and had his own style. Even if it was in his early twenties, they did a full write up. And so it's like pictures of Ralph. What do you think about clothing? Way before he's Ralph Lauren, right? He comes to work and all the tie salesmen, they're like two generations older than him. They're like, first of all, who gives a shit what Ralph Lauren thinks about clothes? And they didn't realize like passion is infectious, right? And so he's talking about stuff that he's really into. But as he builds his career, his, everybody's telling him no. Like he's like, uh, he starts out with ties. He's like, I can't just make, I can't just, there's already, this market's already fulfilled. So I have to make my ties different. So he makes them in different colors. He makes them wider. He makes them in different fabrics, right? And everybody's like, no, you can't do that. And he just persists. And then he winds up succeeding. And they're like, you can't. Well, why are you trying to make clothes? You, you, you're already having the success of ties. Just stay in ties. He's like, because I want to. And then they tell him no. And then he finds his way in. And then he finds a way to, gr to grow the company. Then he uh, winds up selling to Bloomingdale's, right? And he's like, hey, uh, Bloomingdale's, I don't have any money for advertising. I'm selling a lifestyle and an idea, right? This time he's, he's producing ties and shirts and and suits and he's like so i want you to give me my own boutique in bloomingdale's and they're like who the fuck is this kid think he is <laughs> and what's crazy to me is like we walk into a uh, uh uh department store now and they all have like all companies have their own boutiques in it ralph was the first one he invented that he was the first menswear designer to get his own boutique in any uh, in any department store it just happens to be bloomingdale's in manhattan which is like one of the most valuable <laughs> department stores in the world and so the guy at Bloomingdale's talked about they described and this is all tied back to persistence they talked to about ralph a young ralph lauren like i thought that idea was stupid and ralph just he had this he didn't yell it was constant calm pressure you tell him no he'll come back 
we, and then he has another argument, like another, you know, this is why we should do that. And just relentless. And then he finally says, like, I'm going to do this. I want to do it with you. But if I don't do it with you, I'm taking my collection out of Bloomingdale's. And I'm doing, I'll go to Macy's or Saks or whoever's going to give me this. And they're like, just, he was so relentless. Like, okay, th- just, I tap. Like, that's fine. I give up. You have your fucking boutique. And he had his boutique. And like that constant persistence is everywhere. I don't think you build a great company or a great life for that matter without having persistence. So that's the third attribute that I'd add. Totally agree. And as you were talking about uh, Ralph, who lives here in Greenwich, by the way, I see him and his wife on Greenwich Avenue quite frequently. So like they're out and about. They're wow. they're in a super uh, sexy little sports car. Uh, but, you know, you, you see that artist, right? Yeah, and, and he always looks fantastic, right? He's always dressed to the nines in his own yep. stuff. But but as I was listening, I was also thinking about um, Bezos, right? Uh, Relentless was the, if you type WWW Relentless, you go to Amazon, right? Yes. And and like when my daughter got married, who just had my fourth grandchild, a boy, Charlie, I'm delighted about. Yep. Uh, but when she got married, um, I mentioned the this Bezos quote that was just in my mind because I was like, yeah, that's it. And, and he was talking about like, people were asking him for, how do you succeed? How do you, and, and Bezos said something along the lines of, you have to be distinctive. And then he went on to say, society does not want you to be distinctive. It wants you to fit in. It wants to squash you down. And then I kind of put it in, I've been thinking a lot about digital assets, right? Digital assets want to be free, right? And because what's the cost? If you are a widget maker, right? The cost of even, even if you have a monopoly on widgets, if it's a physical widget, the cost of the millionth and first widget is something, right? It, there's a cost as, attached to that. Yep. If you are making digital widgets, the cost is basically the first widget. And then every, you can make a billion and, and your marginal cost is zero. And so one of the things, as I always try to say, well, where, what, where's the ultimate end here, right? Like, and, and the ultimate end, in my opinion, is digital is going to be free. And so what does that leave humans, right? I think a huge amount of things. It, 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 we were talking about uh, good taste and curation, uh, about reputation, about if, yeah. are you like Ralph Lauren and just... Don't take no. Babe Ruth had a great quote, right? You just can't beat the guy who never gives up. And, and so I love that, that combination, but I'm also thinking about it in terms of like looking forward, looking over the, the next like 20 years, the, the things that are going to lead to success in the next 20 years are the only things that we're going to have in common with the people who are big successes in the more physical world is are the things we're talking about right now, right? Reputation, um, you know, persistence, quality, all of those things continue to matter because you can't fake them and you can't like digitize them. The, th- these are things, these are aspects of personality, which kind of leads me into um, our, our listener who's probably been listening to the first hour and he's like, but he's not asking them anything that I asked them <laughs> to ask them. And, and so one of, the, one of the feedbacks that he gave to Liberty was he was fascinated by our discussion about cognitive diversity, right? I, I, I make a point of always going out of my way to say, you know, I don't really care what color you are, what religion you are, what I, I just don't care. What I do care about is, do you think about things the same as everyone else? Or do you think about things very differently? If, if you can add uh, to a network people who are cognitively different, magic happens, right? Because yeah. you can't come up with somebody, you can't ask, it's a quote that I'm stealing, but you, you, you can't ask a guy to make a list of all the things that would never occur to him, right? And, <laughs> and so like the the listener also said, I'd love to hear both of their opinions, uh, David, you and, and Liberty, on not only cognitive diversity, but another thing we were talking about, custom learning. Uh, mm. Liberty, I'm, I'm going to ask you to start because this was something you and I talked about 
extensively. Yeah, and and before I do, I, I when I was listening to you and David about you know persistence and Ralph Lauren and all that, I thought of a metaphor. I don't know if it's a good one, but I love to try to compress ideas right and into a short image or a phrase. And so these people to me they sound like if you're thinking about ships out at sea, some people are just icebreakers, and so they're going to you know go out in front and it's going to be much much harder for them, and they're going to like go through all kinds of obstacles. But if they do, they open up the path for all these others that will follow, right? So if, for example, Ralph Lauren was the first with one of these mini stores inside of the big store, once he proves that it works, it's much easier for all the other fast followers. But by the time these people figure that out, he's probably thinking about the next thing, right? So being at the cutting edge is like, like being a fast follower is, is a great benefit in some ways, right? Microsoft has made a great business of that. But <laughs> um, as long as you really are at the cutting edge and you're always thinking of the next thing, that can also be your advantage. So that, that, that the, the icebreaker image came to me. I, I don't know if it's a good image, I, I, but. I, I actually think that's a great image. And it also ties in, David, to what you and I talked about when we did our podcast about the idea of that, like, I'm a burn the ships kind of guy, right? Like, yeah. I, we all, and by the way, I had fun looking, going down that rabbit hole because it turns out you know, if you're an American or a Canadian or in North America, the story you most often hear is about the conquistadors and, you know, they burn the ships because they didn't want the troops to be able to have an exit strategy. But guess what? The burn the ships story is across cultures. I was reading one in, uh, in a Chinese myth and same story, exact same story different location, different players, but this idea of, and by the way, and David has a great quote, which is you're either on the fucking boat or you're not on the boat, right? I love <laughs> that story. I have stolen that line from him so often because it's just true. It's like, yes or no, in the boat, by the way, once the boat gets there, I'm going to fucking burn it to the ground. You still in? So we, we said it. <laughs> plan, plan B is to make plan A work, right? Exactly. That's a Bezos, that's a Bezos <laughs> quote. He makes the point. He's like, if, you, if people have something to fall back on, they usually fall back on it. Yep. He's like, so you, plan B? Fine. Make plan A work. There's your fucking plan B. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's also like, that, you know, there's another, I'm going, I'm going to have an algorithm and wait until you see what O'Shaughnessy Adventures invests in. Only people with the following characteristics. Um, Another thing that our listener talked about, which uh, Liberty, you and I have talked about a lot, but I would love uh, David's thoughts here too. I'm a huge believer that most of our educational programs are broken. Like they're broken, they're antiquated, they were designed for a completely different environment. Essentially, basically, guys, it was the industrialists of the era saying they better know how to read, they better be able to do simple arithmetic, but most importantly, they better be fucking fine with sitting in the same room for eight hours and doing the same thing, right? Like the environment we're going into is the not exact opposite, but pretty close. In other words, we want our children, and then also we'll get into adult education, but we want our children to learn how to think, not what to think, right? So problem solving, all of these things are very different. We at O'Shaughnessy uh, Ventures just made an investment in synthesis schools, which we're very happy about. Um, and we think that they've got a great program. But let's, let's, I'm just going to throw it to both of you. Let's, let's talk about this idea of like, and, and I'm going to tie it to Liberty's icebreaker thing. So if we're going to icebreaker this, right, what, what, what advice would we give that young person of today? who wants to be an icebreaker along these lines of like bringing in learning. I think about this, I, this concept of like your personal curriculum, right? And so for people like older, uh, our age and older, right? Um, I think it's obviously your obligation, like entrepreneurs and investors are, are continuous learners. They're going to learn until they die. But when we and you had lunch a few weeks ago, what was remarkable to me is like how I was like, I'm just so jealous of the fact that like podcasts, for example, right? Great way to learn. They didn't even fucking exist, right? They, they, when I was in college, they didn't even exist. And so I, I use the example, Liberty, with Jim. I was like, imagine you're a 16 year old kid and you want to learn about investing, right? Like, think about what they could do for free. They could listen to 300 episodes of Invest Like the Best, right? And the education they're going to get from that one single podcast, right? 
listening to the episodes, reading the transcripts, listening to them again, falling down the rabbit holes, reading the books that are recommended, watching the videos is better than any university education. That's just a yep. fact. It doesn't have the fucking credential. It doesn't have the brand and name yet, right? That like a Harvard does. But the actual education, not like the people you meet at school, I'm not discounting that. The actual education, it's far superior. It's far superior. And it's available for free to 16-year-old kids, 17-year-old kids. I get the craziest messages where people are like, you know, 16, 17-year-olds listening to the podcast. They want to be an entrepreneur. Well, if you want to be an entrepreneur, there's probably few, a uh, few people that you don't, uh, that a few better people you could uh, learn from than like a Jeff Bezos who I've done a bunch of episodes. Steve Jobs, I've done 10 episodes on him. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, Da Vinci, Benjamin Franklin. Like, and they could just sit there and listen to 400 hours over and over again in high school. And so that's the way, um, like, I'm obviously going to be biased because uh, that's, this is what connected, you know, me and Patrick, one of the first times we talked was he really gave me this framework. He's like, we're, you're building educational content for the most successful people in the world because the most successful people in the world, like happen to be in, in, investors and entrepreneurs, right? And so you have people that are super successful already listening, but you also have the people that want to be that one day also listening and they can benefit as well. And I think podcast is going to be key to that because a lot of the people that it turns all the time where your eyes are busy, right? Into a form of education. I told you after we get off this podcast, I'm taking my three-year-old son, almost three-year-old son, to Disney for the first time. That's going to be like a four-hour drive by the time we get there. And what am I going to be doing? I'm going to be listening to podcasts. So like instead of just looking out the window, the boring flat Florida land, it's, you know, educating, con like this continuous education because my eyes are busy. That is an un... And if you do that constantly, it's going to compound over your life. Like that's an unfair advantage to people that don't take advantage of this, that technology so that's the way i think about my personal curriculum is essentially two things it's books and podcasts and i think those a combination of those it's very hard to beat those two things yeah liberty yours is a bit broader T tell us about it <laughs> for sure oh i want to say five things at the same time so i'm going to try um first david so right about podcasts i listen to mine on overcast it's an app that uh there's a submenu where it keeps track of how much time you've saved by using some of their features, right? So you can listen at 1.5x, 2x, and then you have a, a feature that reduce, shortens silences between words, right? So you save a little bit of time there. And in my overcast, I've saved a thousand hours just with the shortening silence between words over time, right? And then I listen at 2x. So I'm trying to take over 10 or 15 years, how many thousands of hours of stuff has been, you know, inputs into my brain that I would have to not have even have access to 15 years ago, 20 years ago, right? That's a huge difference. And there's, you know, someone in, in, I don't know, Pakistan or somewhere that's, you know, watching all of the MIT classes online and that's listening to all the same podcasts that we are and that's getting access to incredible information that is going to change their life. So I, I, I totally subscribe to the podcasts are magic, right? It's one of the, the things that are like having someone's voice in your ears for so long creates a very different kind of relationship from, from text. Uh, about education, last time we spoke, Jim, I, I spoke about how important it would be for kids, right? If, if I could teach my kid math and, and languages and all that inside of a Minecraft type game or something, two days later, we would have learned a year's worth of materials, right? Because he would be interested because it, it would challenge him and the progression could go at, at, at his pace, right? So I'm going to go in a different direction today. I think the other thing that the industrial age has kind of all screwed up is they had all these machines, right? All these factories. And the machine has to work um, between this time and this time with this many workers working these, these parts of it. So everybody had to be there at the same time or it didn't work. So it trained everybody to be like clockwork, right? People had to be like machines rather than make machines like people. So everybody from nine to five or, or w much longer back then. I think the way humans are built uh, is totally different. I think everything goes through cycles. There's a season for everything. There's days where the best thing I can do is take a walk in the woods and just think about random stuff. I, 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 I don't know. I play Doom for a while and it recharges my batteries. And then I, I discover something new that's super interesting and I'll have a sprint. And in, in two weeks, I learn more than in the past six months, right? I think people are built like that to, to be like a lion, right? You, you lay around for a while and, and, you know, that part is creative too. That part is, is essential to the process. If you're always trying to go at the same pace, do the same things every day, I don't think you can, you can get to your full potential. I feel like uh, there's a great analogy by, by I think, user Yudkowsky who said that there are some people who have maybe like, they have, they have, I don't know, they are 80 years old, but they have maybe like 15 years of lived life, right? Because all of their days are the same. They just repeat the same days over and over again. And so 
the, 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 the amount of experiences that they've had, right, is very, very limited. While there's someone out there who's kind of like a vampire, right? They're, they're 80 years old, but they have like 800 years of lived experience because they're, they're, they're exploring all the time. They're learning all the time. They're meeting new people all the time. They're like, the, this type of, of life to me feels so much more worthwhile and society should push people in that direction, which is the exact opposite of what it's doing right now. It's pushing people in the direction of every single one of your days should be the same. You should like basically be a machine, right? And ironically, maybe it'll be the machines that we're building right now that are going to unlock this, right? Because automation and all that kind of stuff, like so many jobs, right? Sometimes I, 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 I'm out and about and I'm a store or something and like someone is doing a job that could easily be done by a machine. And while it could suck for that person to lose their jobs, hopefully we create much better jobs than someone just, I don't know, packing boxes at the, the, the post office all day or something like that, right? Um, so so this, this education thing that I wish we would have is, is respecting people's cycles, respecting people's uh, paces, and, and I don't know, just, just connect that with the, the, the more interesting, more, more uh, game-like learning, and I think we'd get so much more out of people. Like so much more, like not uh, just as productivity for for the economy, because I think that would be much better. But they'd be much more, uh, you know, satisfied with their lives. I, you know what jumps out when Liberty says some people live fifteen years in an eighty year life, and some people are like vampires. Uh, the book that you and I were talking about, the one that you just posted about, River of Doubt. Um, I gave I gave Jim a copy when I saw him, and Liberty. When you say stuff like that, I'm like, oh. Teddy Roosevelt technically yeah. lived a short life. I think 60 years, maybe 62. Right. Like, yeah. right. But he lived a hundred, like double the amount. He just three, 300. Filled. Yes. That's one filled. of the best examples. Yeah. That's what popped to my mind. I was like, oh, that's exactly. I mean, he was in, how old was he when he was in that book? He's like in his fi in mid fifties, right? Like, 52. Yeah. 52 yeah. years old. So if any, anybody's yeah. listening like and wants to know what the book is. 10 what, years younger than I am right now, for example. Yeah. The, the book is called The River of Doubt. If anybody's looking for a good read, it's one of the books I give the most of this gift. The, the author is Candace Miller. She's an incredible writer. I just got a new biography by her, which covers um, Churchill when he was in the Boer War. I don't know how to pronounce that, but he's like a young man. Yeah, like a real young man. I think it's like, I have another biography. It's the first 40 years of Churchill's life. I think this is like the first like 25 or something like that. But she's an excellent, excellent writer. Fantastic storyteller. I, I can't, I, I recommend that. I can't recommend that book uh, more. Well, and, 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 and I posted it because, uh, A, to thank you, but also to amplify it. I, I hadn't read that book and I've read, Teddy's one of my favorite people. Um, yeah. and, and I actually have in my notes here, where are the Teddies of today? Hmm. Not in politics. No, God, no. Right? Yeah, no, no they're, they're entrepreneurs, they're scientists, they're engineers, right? There's a different no, filter did. now. But he had like how many career, different careers? Like exactly. This is what I, I liked about like the, the president to you know explore the, the Rough Rider, the Roosevelts, the 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 Benjamin Franklins, the Da Vinci's. It's just like I know. Um, me and Liberty talked about this before. It's like, you know, I I'm guilty of this because I'm over specializing. I'm only doing the podcast, but I I tend to admire the people you know like the Franklins. Like okay, I'll build the first vertically integrated media company, and then I'll make contributions to science, and I'll help develop this new field of electricity then i'll go found a country it's just like you read their you read their biographies or even their wikipedia page like how did one person do all this and what that's a great question who are the teddies now one of the things that's crazy about teddy's like even you think about the presidents we have right at least the presidents in my lifetime like teddy would go the only way to to to, to um campaign across the country at the time he would go on these like three week train trips to campaign and you know what he'd bring with him he's like oh i need to bring my person his version of personal curriculum He'd bring 40 books for three weeks. It's like, how many of our presidents read 40 books in a year? Like, it's and you wrote a, books. You wrote yeah, books about like wrote, birds like, and naval history. And like, yeah. you wrote them and you read them like crazy. And, and I don't have the answer to that question. I have no and, idea who is and, the Teddy of today. And, and that's why I wanted to talk about it with you guys. Because as I was finishing the book, I was just like, God damn it. This guy's life, you know, I've always admired him, right? The, the enter the arena speech, like, yeah. he, like everything he did was action, right? It was a lot of thought, the 40 books, right? Yeah. But I'm a huge believer of, yeah, think the thoughts, but you got to act. Acting is thinking in many respects, right? Because you got to see, right? You, you, if you 
if you have these great thoughts, but you don't act, it's a daydream and it doesn't matter, right? And so, but then I just started obsessing. Like I started going through Wikipedia and I'm like, where, where, where are the teddies? Certainly they're not in fucking politics anywhere. Um, I think Liberty's probably right. I think they're founders. I think they're scientists. I think they're all of these things. But it also gets back to what we were discussing earlier. Like maybe this over specialization has has made it harder, not impossible, right? Because the way I look at the world, the way the world is unfolding, I call it the great reshuffle, right? We have never in human history had the ability to, as you point out, David, you can get a the best education in life for free on the internet. All you got to do is show a little bit of initiative, right? At the tools, podcasting, like you couldn't, we couldn't even be having this conversation 10, 15 years ago, right? And and so, or it'd have to be in person. So I'm I'm flummoxed by this, right? I'm flummoxed by this idea that we have this what I call the 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 framework for a human colossus, right? Because everyone can connect now. We can find like one of our things at OSV with the fellowships, find and fund, right? So t- 10 years ago, am I going to find somebody in Ethiopia who's got a brand new idea about, you know, how to study animal consciousness and then bring it over to AI? Absolutely not. But now, like, you should see these applications. And so yeah. what I'm like, from my perspective, is there is so much talent in our world. And like, it really fucking bums me out when I see these surveys that young people think like they're, they're downcast. They feel the future's worse than the past. They feel mm-hmm. like they're never going to be able to achieve their parents' standard of living. And it just drives me crazy because holy shit, like the, the number of tools that they have available to them. Like, how do we how do we change that story? Because at the end end of the day, by the way, like podcasting works and Patrick's big on this and I agree with him, like stories, talking, that's our original. That's in our base code. If you if you want to know how to get to a human, tell them a story, but tell them a story. Right. I differ with Patrick a little bit because I'm more of a multimedia guy. Um, but <laughs> you know, it's still kind of a story, right? But how do we turn this around? I, I, we are not limited by talent. We're limited by vision. We're limited by, by mindset. Like everything that humanity is doing today, right? All science, all technology is something that someone came up with, that someone built. And so there was nothing that said that it had to happen in 2023, right? A more productive Civilization could could be right here in in fifteen hundred or something like remove the dark ages or we could so so there's nothing stopping us in the future from doing better from accelerating and sometimes I miss the the old optimistic days of like the fifties and sixties sci-fi where everything was about like like thinking up all these utopias and and crazy cool technologies and and a lot of that stuff we kind of built over time and I don't know if it's like post Cold War or post like you know people losing uh losing faith in the elites or something, but all of that vision of the future became very dystopic, very negative. And I feel that's kind of self-fulfilling sometimes. I feel like like if if people uh, don't don't dream it first, right? You need a dream generator. You need to put the dream in the people and then they'll act. If everybody's mind is filled with, it's all going to hell, we're all gonna die from X, Y, Z, right? All the, you, you'll never run out of problems to be worried about. But if you, Okay, for example, take Elon Musk, right? Whatever stuff I, I disagree with, he's making stuff happen, right? EVs and, and re- reusable rockets were going to happen with or without him. But the timeline is very different because of him. We need that kind of shortening of timelines for other kinds of stuff. There, there's all these mega projects that would be great for humanity that we could be working on. And the limit is not the, the engineers, the scientists, the, the, the machines, the computing power. It's just the vision of doing it. You need a program kind of like, you know, JFK deciding to go to the moon, right? That's it. You don't decide to do it. You don't do it. I was seeing the video of him in that speech. Exactly. Do the same kind of project for 
the disease of human aging or something like that, right? That's the kind of stuff I want to see that I think all of humanity could get behind if it's sold properly, if it's explained properly, if you just put the idea that it's something that's possible to do, right? But as long as you think, ah, it's not possible, ah, you, it'll never happen, or ah, it's in a thousand years, as, as long as you can find reasons not to do it today, well, it'll take longer. Without so my answer to that, go. my answer to that question is that um, the world has enough critics, and what we need more is evangelists. And so when I try anything, I try to share on the podcast or share publicly on like social media. It's like you're never going to hear me shit talk things I don't like. There's enough people talking about that's most of the internet talking about things that you don't like. I just talk about things I like. It's like that book yep. was fantastic. This podcast was great. This excerpt was good. Right? We need more evangelists. What was interesting to me uh, was when I was talking to Sam Zell. He's like. You know, I, I, people would tell me to write a book forever. I fought it. I fought it. It was so hard to do. And he's like, you know what one my favorite day now of the week is? He's like, it's Monday. And he goes, because every Monday, me and my team go over all the messages, the inbound messages we get from people that read the book and it impacted their life. It inspired them to start a company. It inspired them to do, you know, go to college. It inspired them to do something with their life. So in his own way, sharing his life story in a form of a book, right? And then promoting the hell out of it. That dude was on like every single podcast. Like he was really trying to get that word out there, right? And as a result of that, it's like this guy, you take all what he loves is like his plane and his houses and like all, like being famous and being rich. He's like, I like the messages. I like hearing from individual people that I fucking changed their life. And I told him that. I was like, I've heard from people that heard the podcast I did on your book. People who live in fucking Africa, Pakistan, Japan you know, all kinds of crazy stories, like being influenced by that. So I don't think it's going to be like come from the top down. I just think you, you like, hey, the world has enough critics. Evangelize the stuff that you're interested in. Evangelize the stuff that you're passionate about. And in every way, like each one of us might only affect a thousand people, 2000 people, 10,000 people in our lives. But then those 10,000 people like push that on. And that's, uh, that's the way I think it's done. And I do agree with Patrick and I agree with what you just said. Uh, it's a story. It's, it's learning storytelling. Um, it, it's Steve, Steve Jobs has a great quote, and he used that to build Apple, right? He's like, the storyteller is the most powerful person in the world. So nope. that is the way we communicate ideas that will be remembered. It's through stories. It's not through rote memorization. So learn, like studying. I have two, a bunch of books. I've read a bunch of books on uh, filmmakers. They're my favorite uh, biographies to read, actually. And now I have two more. I just got Quentin Tarantino's new book, and then I got a biography of Christopher Nolan. And it's just like, I want to know how the hell they learn storytelling, how they literally have an idea in their mind, put it on paper, then bring it to life through film that millions and millions of people enjoy. And then you could do that for whatever they're interested in, you know, telling this particular story. Maybe it's Pulp Fiction. Maybe it's, you know, the idea is intended, whatever it is. It's like, what's the story that you want to tell the world? And then just push it and promote the hell out of it. And uh, I obviously agree. I always say that I want to root for things as opposed to against them. And, and like, I love your take on that, though. I prefer it. Actually, I'm going to steal it from you. I, we the world is filled with critics, right? And like, go on social media. It's people like all they're doing is criticizing. All they're doing is negative thinking. And I am obsessed with the power that thoughts have over our actions. And you know, if you fill your mind with it can't be done, there's no way that this, there's no way I can do that. You know what? You're going to be right, Eleanor Roosevelt. Right? We had a version of that. And, and it, it just seems to me to be one of the most obvious things in the world. And yet, like, we, we did a vertical for films because I love movies too, David. And I got, like, really fucking tired of just watching these dystopia after dystopia after dystopia. Now, listen, why are they doing that? Well, I get it we're domesticated primates, right? And what are we driven by? We are driven by emotions. And what is like in the Lord of the Rings, what is the one emotion that rules them all? It's fear. And especially novel fears, right? So if you're going to tell a story um, and it doesn't have a lot of fear in it, you're not going to attract people's attention. The way our brain works is I'm glancing around the room here, right? And my brain stops taking it in because there's nothing new, right? If there was something new or there was like a mouse running at me over here, I would react. The brain, though, is a cognitive miser. And the way we set it up, right, it's like, see the pattern, 
scan for, is there anything different? No, shuts down, <laughs> right? So I just, it's, it's like, to me, I just would love to find a way. That's what you know, like we're trying to do with OSV. They're not making the movies that I think should be made. I'm going to fucking make them. And like, you know, when, when was the last Rudy made? The, the story about the kid going to Notre Dame. Like, inspirational as hell. And so we're making a movie about my friend David Roney, who I discovered through, again, I would have never discovered David in, a, in the old world, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I'm a big believer, and if you want to try to understand something, David Bohm said, if you want to understand something, write a book about it. And I, which I agree with, I've written four, but the fact <laughs> is, I also believe, like, if you want to, if you want to, like, figure out how something works, do it, right? So I wanted to figure out NFTs. I thought, you know, my, my natural reaction was, yeah, yeah, you know, and I thought, but you know what? Let's make one. Let's see what happens. And so we made one. The auction of it brought in a ridiculous amount of money, like the in Ethereum, the equivalent of $40,000. And the guy who bought it was a very successful immigrant who had started a very successful um, software company. And one of the things that I'd learned about NFTs is you got to let them unlock something because that is very helpful and it's good for use cases, right? Like bands will be using them because they can unlock all sorts of different levels, right? From just general admission to getting your picture taken with your favorite singer behind stage on based on what you paid for the NFT. So I think there's a, there are actual use cases. But anyway, our use case was you can come co-host an Infinite Loops or you can be the guest. So the guy who bought it was like, can I suggest somebody? And I'm like, sure. So he suggests David because he has this thing of paying it forward. And the way he put it was, I hate when I see people who are under the radar who should be way above the radar. And, and so I had David on. And this is, I was still chairman of OSAM, right? So nobody really knew what was happening in terms of like O'Shaughnessy Ventures and everything. And so after I record the podcast with David, we turn it off and I look at him and I go, will you let me make a movie about you? And he's like, <laughs> what the fuck, man? I thought you were an asset manager. And I said, yeah. things are coming down <laughs> the pipe. But, but to see this, this wonderful set of disparate outcomes, right? Like feeding this new movie, which I think is, I, David is one of the most inspira inspirational men I've ever met. And like, he's talking about an active learner, a constant learner. This guy is a first principles thinker and he's, oh, he's also a savant in cryptology. Oh, oh and by the way, naval officer. Uh, oh, by the way, wanted to become a doctor. Now is a robotic surgeon. Like he's like young. Maybe he's our Teddy. Maybe he's our Teddy. <laughs> still there time. You know. There's still time. Yeah. How, uh, so, do you know how old he is? I think he's like 40. I'd have to look it up. Though. Okay, I, so yeah, I, I didn't. So I we didn't, gotta, we yeah. gotta figure out what Teddy was doing. I, I do that when I read biographies. I'm like, okay, how old is he in the story, or how old is she in the story? And then I try to figure out. It's like, okay, what were they doing when they were my age? And it's very, it's very fascinating. It's like a lot of the success comes with Liberty was saying before we started. It's like this myth of the, the overnight success. It's like they were laying the foundation when they were maybe 25 or 35 or 45, but a lot of it came later in life. Like their big wins came later. So you might be right. Like, like what is David doing at 50? 55, 70, you know? Yeah, I, I expect that he will be doing a lot of the foundational things he's doing right now, which are continual learning, continual questioning, not being afraid to say, hey, I have no idea what you're talking about. Will you explain this to me like I'm a five-year-old? You know, because, and, and he's got this incredibly sharp, incisive mind. I, I put him on my advisory council because like, I've often gone to him with questions. He's, he's, his knowledge base is ridiculous and, and it spans so much, which gets me to what I want to talk about next. Cause I, listener, I don't know who you were, but I'm doing a horrible job of covering the subjects. But I, if you put me in a room with these guys, that's always going to happen. And, and so one of the things that he mentioned in his thing uh, that you shared with me, Liberty, was he was talking about AI. And he was talking about uh, generative art. And, and so he, he was like, 
you know, you said something, I think it was you or me, I can't remember who said it, but it really, again, now, David, talking to your getting into a, a listener's ear, right? Mm -hmm. One of you said, appreciators of art have a different perspective on art. Shouldn't we also consider the people who are looking at art? And then I see a Degas quote, which is, art is not what you see, by, but what you make others see. I know, Liberty, that you, you've, like, you've become this amazing artist using Jeff <laughs> Art. And, and he, so, he sent me a few in DM. They're, fuck, they're incredible. They really they're incredible. are. Yeah. They're unbelievable. Yeah. Talk yeah. about uh, uh, going from stick figures to uh, nice digital paintings overnight, right? But tools but, are but, powerful. But let me interject, right? That, that story in and of itself is fantastic because, right? Because we, I, I can't draw anything. We're shit, right? <laughs> and like now that I have this tool, I, I have a lot of ideas and I look at this as a tool, right, to be able to generate what's in my mind. And look, I understand where actual artists who are painters or sculptors or whatever, I understand the reticence, the some of them are, are quite angry. My view is you need to hear them out. You need to have a conversation with them. You need to be able to engage. Right. Because just telling them they're wrong, like that's dumb to me. It's kind of like, have you ever thought about it this way, that this is a tool? And then I found some artists who are like evan evangelists, David, for what they're doing with AR, AI and what they're doing is iterating on their own work. And I had a oh, great conversation with a guy who's like, it's magic. He goes, I trained up the, the, and I'm not going to say which system he was using. He trained up the system on his own artwork. And then he started iterating back and forth. And he basically said to me, like, I view this as my work because, but would I have ever had this insight without this ability to have this companion iterate along with me, kind of iterate with, you know, with myself. And, and then the, the, the last thing I'll say is another O'Shaughnessy um, uh, Advisory Council member, Rory Sutherland, had a great quote, and it kind of ties to the appreciators of art, right? Mm -hmm. And it was, his quote is, value resides not in the thing itself, but in the minds of those who value it. What do you guys think? I, I've, I've probably written 30 times about generative AI art in the past six months. It's one of my big rabbit holes, right? And so I, there's so much I want to say about this. One thing I'm going to say is creating art is kind of a mix of different things. And I think we've kind of unbundled these things a little bit, right? So there's the execution. Like I know how to hold a, a, a pen or a brush and I know how to mix the paints and do it, but that's only the execution. That part we've kind of unbundled into the other part, which is the taste of the person making it, all of the decisions, right? So anyone can download Stable Diffusion and have it run 24 seven, generating thousands of, of images all the time. And it doesn't mean that any of them will be good, right? So the person using the tool still has a lot of input into it. And I feel like I'm flexing some of the same muscles I'm flexing when I'm, I'm playing with it as when I'm doing, um, uh, making photos, right? When I'm walking out in the woods and I see a cool tree or a cool shadow pattern or some moss somewhere or any kind of that stuff is is about the curation of what I what I want to show, right? What or what I see. And different people could walk by the same place with the same camera, right? And someone could take terrible photos, and and say your wife could walk by and take great photos, right? So that part may have been kind of unbundled from the execution. I also believe that artists were kind of stuck with the execution because it could take like, I don't know, 15 years to become great at one type of execution, say. So say I, I, I'm become a great painter at this type of oil painting and I, I make a certain type of painting, right? Will I spend 15 more years learning a totally different type of art, right? A sculpture or a different type of painting or digital painting or whatever. Some of the skills are transferable, but many of them aren't. I feel like with these tools now, like 
you used to be kind of not stuck, but you used to be restrained to a certain style that, that, that you built, uh, for yourself. And now stylistic fluidity is going to become a new thing. So the same curator, the same taste is going to be able to produce art in many more types of styles. And that's one of the things that I like with playing with these tools. It's some of, some of my images, like I did a series of like, uh, lighthouses on cliffs with waves crashing right. and, they were awesome. and I, I, I have some cabins in the woods. I have some, some huge uh, AI robots in museums based on one of my people, right? All these things are very different in some ways, but in another way, you could probably show them all to someone mixed, mixed, uh, randomly with images generated by the same program, but generated by other people. And I think you may be able to tell which one came all from the same person. You may not be able to say, oh, that's Liberty exactly, but they, they kind of have some of the same, I don't know, some of the same, uh, vibe or some of the same taste, uh, filter through them. Right. That's one of the things I always try to do with my writing is I wish that my readers could be shown a text I wrote without any bylines, without any graphics, without any markings, just reading the text and they could say, oh, that, that sounds like Liberty, right? That sounds like his voice. That's what I'm trying to do with the writing. And I feel with other types of art, that's basically what every artist is trying to do, right? They're trying to express something that's uniquely theirs. And these tools still allow that. You can still make crap with it, but you can make crap with real paint and real brushes and like, like people blaming the tools for, for a lack of taste or lack of curation or that, 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 that's going about it the wrong way. Right. And I feel like the other thing that people don't appreciate is that inside of the model, right? Because the, the model is trained on a lot of existing images from all kinds of places. But what the model does is it finds the patterns and that stuff, and it compresses those into a model that is doing the new images. Well, the model doing the new images doesn't contain what it was trained on. It couldn't fit, right? It would be terabytes and terabytes and terabytes, right? And so it's very similar to what a human artist does. A, a guitarist will listen to music and, and will play cover songs all the time. And then when they create something new, it doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from all these patterns that they've learned, right? I kind of like the vibe of, of, I don't know, of Jimi Hendrix on this. I'm going to add a little bit of Pink Floyd vibe and uh, a little jazz in there. And, and right, they, 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 take, they take pieces from all the stuff that they like and they make it uniquely theirs over time, right? They develop a voice. I feel like these tools have, have learned kind of like a human cover band did with other people's work. But what comes out on the, uh, on the other hand, it's very hard to say that, oh, they, they're using our work. Well, humans are also using copyrighted work all the time. I feel like the filter should be at the end of the process. It should be, if it looks like something that's copyrighted, right? If I generate a bunch of Mickey Mouse images with a generative AI, well, maybe copyright law could stop me from commercializing them. But I don't think anyone should be stopped from learning from Mickey Mouse pictures. Because if we go down that route, it's a slippery slope where what well, band can learn from other bands, uh, painters can learn from other painters, and every living artist is going to describe art by the style of others, right? I just said it, right? It sounds a bit like Pink Floyd mixed with Metallica with some Bob Dylan. It's like, you know exactly what I mean. If I couldn't use references to existing copyrighted work, how do you describe stuff, right? That, that's the human vocabulary, right? That's how we think about stuff. We compare it to other things. We're uh, just mixing it all up, right? Someone born in the jungle that's never listened or seen or anything, they may make super original art, but they may lack input also, right? That, that we just need it to feed the artist. So, all right, that, that was my, my long thing on generative AI. To totally agree with you, as you know. Um, and, you know, it, you're, you're, I thought as you were talking, I was just thinking about like way pre-AI, Andy Warhol, right? Yep. What, look at what he did. I mean, like he took an existing, his, he's very famous for the Campbell soup cans that like that trade in the tens of millions of dollars. And you're thinking, why Duchamp with the urinal, right? So who the fuck is going to buy that? Right. The, the idea is the concept, right? It's the, yes, it's all the concept. And we now have these tools that give people who didn't have access to be able to even their own creativity, right? We have these tools where they can extend it, where, where they can mix it up, where they can blend it. And like, I just think that's one of the coolest things in the world. And basically, when you look at new technologies or even new styles of art, right? The one predictable thing, the one 
predictable thing is that there is a sizable minority of human beings who hate it and want to do everything to stop it. And you think, I'm thinking of like ads. It might have even been, you might have surfaced it for me, Liberty. Yeah, well, the canned music, you're right. Yes. When, when the silent movies became uh, ad, ad soundtracks and there, there used to be a bunch of piano players in the theaters playing piano to the movies. And they took, they took ads in the papers saying like, this canned music is going to ruin everything. Exactly. This is awful. This is going to ruin everything. And it, the same about TV, the same about radio. In radio, they used to, like, if you go to the Way, Way Back machine, or there's a bunch of resources online that you can find to find these old articles. Like, I went back and looked at, like, as radio was getting big, this has multi-dimensions, right? Because I'm interested from a point of view of an investor. Little known fact, but RCA never achieved the high it received in whatever, hmm. 19 whatever, because people were so excited about this new technology of radio that they priced RCA to price to magic, uh, price to perfection ratios. And it never, never got there again. So it interests me in terms of both the enthusiasts, but also the detractors. But one of the things about radio, you keep going into these time machines, right? You see the same picture. It's almost like, Wait a minute. <laughs> this seems like it's odd that I see these same dead birds, and it's always dead birds with a radio tower in the back. Yeah, and then convenient. yeah, and then underneath it, are we being killed by radio waves? Which brings back to right fear, right, and novel fears, and all of those things. But I also find that humans are remarkably adaptable creatures, right? I think, and I. I talk about iPhones a lot, right? And that's why I like this book, The Weirdest People in the World, because they make a really good case for the fact, well, you know, we built this, right? We built this iPhone because of cumulative cultural knowledge, right? It's when, when the printing press got invented, right? Th by the way, there were people against that too. Oh yeah. Going to spread heresy. People interpreting the Bible on their own. This is going to lead to dogs and cats sleeping together. I mean, the fucking things that people will go on and on about that are always negative, but it's always a new tech. But then, like this thing, talking about Kennedy, right? Uh, and his inspiring speech, let's go to the moon. This is like a thousand times as powerful as all the computer power. We got there by cumulative cultural knowledge and evolution, which after we, in, or after Gutenberg invented the printing press, allowed us finally to mass time bind our thoughts. And by time binding, that's our, I'm stealing that from Robert Anton Wilson, uh, who, I who I read last night, actually stole it from somebody else, and I can't remember who he stole it from. But this is, is in itself an example, right? I'm making a point based on all of these other people who add it to my learning base, right? And, and what is new, right? There's another point I want to make. I want to put the idea out there. And I think a podcast is a great place. I never hear this. What is new? So say you're a painter and, and someone could go into stable diffusion or any of the others and write your name and produce something in your style, right? And your style is kind of like a very vague thing. And maybe the thing is not really your style, but it looks like it. Say someone else writes um, something, something, that name plus Picasso plus Rembrandt, right? That person doesn't exist. There's no painter out there that mixes those three. That's a new thing. That's a brand new thing. Almost nobody will use these tools to exactly replicate what someone is already doing. That person's already doing it. They're doing new things. Either the topic is new, the angle is new, the, the color schemes are new, they're mixing different styles together in a new way, right? It doesn't take that much to make something new. So when you say that the iPhone is, is uh, the, the end result of a cumulative, like all, all kinds of industries that had to build up to the point of being able to like touch screens and, and you know, systems on the chip that use like milliwatts and all these things together. Well, the iPhone is new, but you could always argue, well, well no, it's not new because touch screens already existed. This already exists. Well, sometimes the execution is new, right? You have to do something that's good enough and then it's considered new. Uh, someone else maybe had all the parts, but if they did, didn't do anything with it, right? It's like the, the Xerox Spark thing. Everybody's like, oh, Steve Jobs went over there and he copied everything, right? They had, 
They had a windowed system. They had a mouse. That, yeah, but it all sucked and it all went, didn't go anywhere and they never executed and they never packaged it up into something people could use. So ideas are great, but they're not enough. You have to execute and you have to mix and match. And that's the, that's the creation process. If you only consider something new when it's like new, like from the big bang, right? There's no other steps in between. You, you, nothing is new, right? Find me something that's entirely new. Like I, I challenged anyone, even big leaps forward, like Einstein was decades ahead of everybody else. Like we still talk about it today because it was so far ahead of everybody. And so, you know, it was not based on much else, right? In the sense that so many discoveries, if this person wasn't finding it, someone else was finding it like two years later. Well, even Einstein was based on a bunch of not new stuff. So you could claim that he's not original. And, and where does it stop? Right, right? when you, and, when you start going down that route. David, I want to bring you in because I think I might have another heuristic uh, for what to look for in, in a founder that you want to back. When you and I talked about AI, the only thing you said to me was you, you fastened on, oh, wait a minute. And, and you started listing all of the ways that AI would make, say, for example, your podcast better, right? You thought about all the new, uh, to, to Liberty's point, right? You weren't like asking questions about, well, either, you know, this, go, can I, no, you were like, oh, I can make, wait a minute, can, 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 do you have an AI that could train up my podcasts on uh, short videos? We got one coming, uh, we, but talk about that because I, that, I think that's another key aspect. So you two know way more about generative AI than I do, right? But when I'm sitting here listening to your conversation, then I heard what you said that one artist say, it's like, oh, I, I, I'm actually using this. And I was like, what he's doing is smart. And what I think with Liberty's perspective is, is like, you shouldn't see this as a threat. You should see it as a tool. And I think that principle is like you just said, you know, I study uh, beginning of industries for a living is just one way you can think about founders podcasts and humans just say the same shit over and over again. Like they're terrified of any kind of new change and people throw the way the word technology around and the way people think about technology now is like they think you know, software, computers, AI, but like, uh, in zero to one, uh, Peter Thiel has this great line and I've heard it from other ways. It's like properly understood technology is just a better way to do something. Right. Yeah. And so when you guys are talking about this, I'm like th this, this, human nature that repeats where it's like you see new things as a threat right you're just going to be like life is going to happen to you but there's usually founders entrepreneurs scientists people uh, like trying to create something new it's like they see it as a tool so i think of like in andrew carnegie's case i just read his autobiography again and the crazy thing is like he went over to england he's living in america at the time but he went over to england and they invented a new way to produce steel it's like the best summer process and what he realized is like oh my god i'm going to dedicate my entire like put all my eggs in this basket because it took a process that used to take two weeks to make steel and took it down to 15 minutes. And so it's just like, you're still making the same thing. Now you're doing it 1300 times faster. And oh. the reason he knew that was so important is because his father uh, used to use, uh, was like a, a weaver, right? And he used a loom. And then you had his dad resisted the new change in technology, which was like a steam powered loom, which is again, tech, properly understood technology is a better way to do something. So what used to take him, you know, maybe all day could be accomplished by machine, machine power. Now his dad's like, no, 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 that's, you know, that's a threat. Instead of seeing it as a tool, that decision to see it as a threat instead of a tool, uh, sent his entire family into poverty because you can't, once technology, the genie's out of the box, generate AI. Like there's nothing, it's not going back in the fucking box, right? So if you keep it seeing it as a threat, you're going to get run over. So then you fast forward, they have to flee to America because of his dad's resistance to technology. We can't make any money anymore. I think they're in Scotland, goes to America. Uh, Andrew Carnegie starts working in factories at, you know, 13 years old and his entire career, whether he was learning telegraph, learning how to, uh, to, to do iron, to build railroads, to build steel, it's, Hey, invest in technology. And he was like a younger guy in the steel business. And so the old timers are like, why do you keep buying all these new machines? Like, you don't need this. We've been doing this way forever. And his whole point is like, invest in technology, the savings compound. And sometimes it can be the difference between a profit and a loss. And so the same guys a few years later that said, hey, you don't need that new machine, realized that he can now produce che uh, steel cheaper than them. They were rendered obsolete and extinct from his business. And uh, Andrew Carnegie's competitive advantages kept compounding to where he built, you know, the most valuable steel company in the world. And again, it's because he saw the new technology as a tool, not a threat. And so that's like the, the main principle behind the discussion. When you guys are talking, like, what's the principle behind here that could be applicable to not just artists 
or not just steel makers, equipment, whatever. It's like, see it as a tool, not a threat. Exactly. I love that. And that is a great, another quote of yours. I will be stealing. I usually, <laughs> but sometimes I forget because I, I have the uh, okay. privilege of talking to so many smart people. The, the, and, and by the way, there are a million, a million examples of if you look at it as a tool, you're going to be Carnegie, right? And, but what's interesting is your idea of compression. That's something that I think about a lot. What, as listeners know, I'm the chairman of the Board of Stability AI, which is an open AI company. And one of the things that the founders and the people who work there are so proud of is their ability to compress all of this data so, th so that we can fit it on an iPhone or on an Android. And, and so, but it also bleeds over as I listen to you, David, to this idea of, and, and bringing in Liberty, what you said, I always think of Basquiat, the famous, uh, artist who started life as a, uh, basically a, a graffiti artist. Mm -hmm. And, um, he, I never knew this until I was reading this thing and I was fascinated by it. So it turns out Basquiat had a partner who they, their art was so similar that even they couldn't tell the difference if they went back to something that they'd done. Even they didn't know which of them had done it, right? Wow. And so I'm reading about this and then I read, so Basquiat gets into the network with Andy Warhol, right? The, again, one of my other fascinations is this idea of loose networks and the power that they have. And, and so his, his partner says, that's bullshit. Like that, that you, you're going to go corporate. You're going to do all these things. I, you, you, you're losing your soul, man. And, and so Basquiat was like, whatever, dude. And so Basquiat goes on to become one of the fame. He died tragically of a drug overdose, but he goes on for his brief time. Talk about packing years into a brief light, uh, David. Like he, mm -hmm creates almost this new artistic movement, right? And then the story I was reading goes back to the partner. Nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows where he is. And, and like, it's that binding. It's, it's not enough to just do. It's enough that you, you know, you've got to add to that. You got to say, like, okay, how can I share this with the world, right? And, and if, if your mentality, because this is another thing I've been obsessed with, right? We start as like on the plains, the world's very inhospitable place. So we start out basically learning negative sum games, right? Like about well, lions one, gazelles minus one, right? It's not enough for, for me to succeed. You've got to die because you're my dinner, right? And mm -hmm. so we start on negative sum games, which are horrible, right? And lead to stasis and lead to horrible conditions. Then we finally figure out humans can work together. Oh, this is interesting. We can tribe up. And by doing that, we're going to become the apex predator on this planet. Awesome. But that only moved us up to zero sum games, right? Because we saw resources as limited naturally, right? Why do you think gold is the first, you know, uh, I can't remember. I think it was Keynes called it a barbarous relic. But, you know, we wanted something that we thought was rare to set up a currency system. And, and so I understand the thinking behind it, but like, Zero sum games, it, which is where I think we spent most of our lives and not our lives, our grandfather, great, 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 all the way back. What stories were people hearing around? Well, we were still tribes, right? What were they hearing? They were probably hearing zero sum stories. Um, resources are limited, right? You, if you don't get to that resource b before Grog, it's gonna, you're, you're going to lose and Grog is going to win. And so that drive, that drove all sorts of things, but it drove coordinated markets, right? And it drove a lot of the thinking that led us to where I think we are today, which is we, we, are, we have the potential. I don't know that it will happen, but we have the potential to start playing only positive sum games. And it's like the entire philosophy of O'Shaughnessy Ventures. We will not invest in something that we do not deem a positive sum game because like i passionately believe you're talking about carnegie and this is this is great because wh where does where does where does that better process come out of 
the minds of men and women. We didn't leave the Stone Age because we were or because we ran out of rocks, right? We got better ideas <laughs> and we yeah. built and we built and we built, right? So I see this as this extension of humanity, right? And we're at a really cool I'm I cannot tell you how happy I am that I'm alive during this particular period. Because like we have the ability again through nothing magical, right? Like David's point, these are tools. These, it, we just have better tools. And, and so, like, I think the, the, the big, big question here, and God, I would love advice, because, like, how, how do we get people to, to understand this? Because I'm, I'm a huge, like, I'm a well-known anti-authoritarian. Like, I, I'm, I view my purpose in life is to be useful. And how am I useful? I'm useful by highlighting interesting things, kind of like you, David, kind of like you, Liberty. We all kind of have the same purpose, right? Which is we, we there's things that we are absolutely passionate about. We get good at it. We put the time in and then we share it. And your point about your lunch with Sam Zell is well taken. Like the nicest things that were ever said to me about people who had invested with us was people who would come up to me and say, hey. I just want to thank you. You bought our summer cottage. And I'm like, no, I didn't. <laughs> you bought your summer cottage because you made that decision, right? And, and so it made me feel good, but it also made me kind of think about this idea that like you cannot, com it, again, the, the Tao says it's so much better than I do. You know, the worst ruler is, is, is he or she who rules through fear and intimidation. And then it goes all the way up to the best ruler is one that when something is accomplished, the people go, we did it all on our own, right? Mm -hmm. So how, like if I made, if I, it was like an assignment, David, I'm going to start with you and then we're going to go to Liberty. How, is there a way to like get people to like engage without telling them like the old school way? You must do this, David. I actually believe that humans just do what they want to do. Um, that you can obviously influence them, you can evangelize, you can spread like the things that you're into, but you can't make anybody do anything. Like I just read this fantastic book. It's called like um, by Peter Bevelin. And it said, I think the title is like, tell me where I'm going to die. And so I won't go there. And it's like this collection, <laughs> this collection of all these like quotes and statements by Munger and Buffett, but in like a, um, like in this, like almost like fictional conversational flow. The book, the book is actually really fascinating, by the way. But what it's what's, by, the, like, what, what's the title? Sorry, what's the title? It's called um, "Tell Me Where I'll where, where, Tell Me Where I'm Going to Die So I'll Never Go There" by Peter Bevelin. Cool. Um, it's really hard to find, actually. Um, but it was, I actually uh, discovered it from uh, my friend Eric Jorgensen. is the one that recommended it, which was you know he's he's got a fantastic uh, he's got an amazing book called The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, but he's very well read. So when he recommends a book, I, I just automatically buy it. But what I was struck is like how many times in that book and how many, and like in the book, you could see the quote. And then if you go back to the notes, it'll say, what was this said in a shareholder letter? Was this said at the meeting? What year was this said? And they were remarkably consistent over and over again that they said in our 60 years of experience, we were, uh, we were always unsuccessful while trying to change somebody's mind, right? Like you can't force it on people. Like there's a reason that you're attracted to what you're attracted to, like why your, your, light, your eyes light up about certain technologies. Same thing with Liberty. The reason that I recommend Liberty's newsletter and the reason I pay for it is because he does a fantastic job curating things that he's interested in. It's like, but no one, there's no one telling him, hey, Liberty, you should write about this in the newsletter. He just, for so, something's speaking to him. And I don't actually understand this phenomenon. The, the best uh, quote I've ever heard on it is Jeff Bezos saying that like, we don't choose our passions, they choose us. Right. And I don't know how to infect other people with your passion than other just sharing it and explaining on like, like how I try to do it with the books and the podcast. It's like, this idea is amazing. Like this, I find this story like a, of a young Ralph Lauren going back to that is like really inspiring. The fact that the reason I looked for a biography on Ralph Lauren, let me give you an example, Jim, is I watched this documentary on HBO on Ralph Lauren. It's called Very Ralph. It came out like 2019. And I had known the brand, didn't know the story, but in the, the very beginning he talks about first of all i didn't know he grew up with like no money um he grew up sharing uh one bedroom with two older brothers right so it's like it's like not only do you not have your own room there's three of you in there then he goes on his own gets married real young his wife is 19 i think he's 24 she's like 
we slept on a, we had a mattress on a floor in a shitty apartment in New York. The L train ran above our head. And that's where they're living when, when, when Ralph jumps and takes this very risk, you know, this huge risk saying, I want to, I don't want to work for other people. Like I'm going to build my brand. And he starts out doing these ties, which I mentioned earlier. But the, the reason that he's so, so appealing for me and the reason I wanted to read a biography was because just what he did next, he goes to Bloom, finally gets a meeting with Bloomingdale's. Bloomingdale's like, we love your ties. We're going to place a big order. Remember, he's got no money this time. They're like, okay. And Ralph's like, that's fucking fantastic. But you have to take your brand name off and put our name. And he immediately packs up his ties and says, no, thank you. I'm building my brand and leaves. And I say on the podcast, I just released, it's like, it's one thing to turn on an opportunity when you're already rich. It's completely fucking different when you have a wife, a young wife, you're living in a shitty apartment, you have no money and you don't even have a business. You have a fledgling business. And for him to still say, no, 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 this is my passion. It chose me when I was a young boy and I'm going to see this passion through. So I don't necessarily think I, there is an answer to the question other than what we're already doing, which is like through your podcast, through your Twitter feed, through your constantly evangelism, evangelizing, uh, through Liberty's newsletter, through my podcast. It's just like, hey, this is a cool idea. Look what this person did. What if you took that idea and applied it to your life? What would, like, what's your version of, build, like, I don't, I don't want to be a fashion designer, but I want to take the same, just like I don't want to build a steel company. But I take principles through Carnegie and Ralph and it's like, but I, I'll apply those ideas to my business, which is podcasting. Which is why when we had lunch, I was like, oh shit, I didn't know anything about sta you know, stability uh, fusion or stable diffusion, stability AI. And I immediately said, I was like, oh, that's a tool. How can I take the 400 hours of audio that don't have video content on it and like have an AI automatically animate, animate it and maybe cut it up into 30 second or 60 second clicks, clips to spread it all over the internet to then point back to the source material where it's like, hey, if you listen to this podcast, it might make your life and career better. So that's, that, that's my, I can only say like my answer is use, my answer to those questions through my actions. And like, that's how I'm like, those are my actions. Agree. Liberty, how about you? Uh, I agree with David that you can't, uh, on the individual level, it's very, very hard to make anyone do anything. But if I look at it from a different angle, I think this, this great reshuffle, right? The internet, the, the, these loose network, well, the networks are everywhere now. And I feel like if we go back almost all of humanity, it was, it was rocky ground, right? So if you were creative, you were trying to plant some seeds and it's nothing grows there. There's gatekeepers. There's, you don't have access to people, data, knowledge, inspiration. Like it, it's very, very hard. And I feel like what's making it less zero sum and what's going to convince people today is that the ground is much more fertile, uh, not to mix metaphors, but there, these icebreakers we talked about, right? Some people could go through anything and still succeed. And so back then in the 50s and in the, in the 1800s, whatever, some people could still figure out a way to come out on top, right? Teddy was going to go through like buffaloes and cavalry chargers and anything. He was going to go down the river that nobody at, at, at Ravazani, he was going to figure it out. But most people are not like that. They still have great ideas. They could still do great things, but there are too many obstacles. There are like, I'm not part of the Ivy League network. I don't have capital. I can't buy machines. Like, too many things stopped them, so they didn't, you know, flourish and 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 create this non-zero sum kind of society, right? That's why um, the, the, the all the gatekeepers had to appeal to only the center of the bell curve, right? Because when there's only three channels, the way to maximize viewers and and money, well, you appeal to the very center of the the bell curve distribution, and everybody who's outside of it, well, they, they don't feel spoken to, right? And probably even the people in the center. But in this world of the internet. How many millions of people are uploading videos to YouTube or making podcasts or writing newsletters or even just sharing their thoughts on Facebook with their family or on Twitter or whatever. all this kind of stuff? It doesn't mean it's all great, but it exists and it didn't used to. And the cream can rise to the top, right? Because the internet is very good at one thing. It's finding good stuff. It doesn't happen overnight. But when I discovered David's podcast in, I don't know, 2018 or something like that, like I, I started sh sharing it with everybody. And, and for years, it's like, why, why, why isn't why anybody talking about this? <laughs> but the internet figured it out, right? They found you. And, and I feel like that's, that's the, the chance that people have now that they didn't used to have. Because if you had been recording like cassette tapes in the 60s and dropping them on street corners, well, it's a great little project. But there wasn't the, the fertile ground where those, those seeds could grow into oak trees or whatever, whatever analogy you want to make here. So, so I feel like you can't change the people but out of everybody, some of those people wanted to do it before and they couldn't because of the kind of the structure. And now the structure is much, much more, um, you know, 
permissive on, on, for all these people. So you may not be able to change someone who doesn't want to do it, but at least now the person who wants to do it can find ways to do it, even if they're like some small village in India or somewhere like we're all connected That's a good and point. we can all find their great stuff and they, get, they can all push it out without a, a gatekeeper. And like that, that's how I developed O'Shaughnessy Ventures. It's how I developed Infinite Loops. Like I, I was convinced my thesis was time, space, clap. I, uh, it, it just all collapsed. And, and what's left is what Matt Clifford calls the greatest variance amplifier in history, the internet. And then I was watching the David Bowie interview. Uh, side note, Jeremy Paxton, uh, the guy who's interviewing him for the BBC, I gave a speech there in like, I can't remember, 99 or 2001. Anyway, I didn't know anything about this guy. And he's like famous in the UK for asking brutal questions. Right. And, and so like I'm sitting at the dinner beforehand and a guy comes up to me, the guy who sponsored me giving the speech. And, and he's a Brit and he's like, so you've done your homework on Jeremy, I hope. And I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> but but the point I want to bring back, he's he, it, it turned out great. And he asked really great questions. Uh, he was interviewing David Bowie in 1999. And I know that this is a classic that a lot of people refer to, but I, yep. I hadn't rewatched it for a while. And I rewatched it. And like, this guy was an alien, man. He Genius. was so far ahead of his time that, I mean, you could, it, I recommend all of our listeners and viewers go type that into YouTube, BBC, David Bowie, 1999 interview on internet. Like it, you'll see the long version, you'll see the short version, but one of his great pull quotes is, the potential of the internet, both good and bad, is unimaginable. And Paxton is just isn't getting it, right? And, and Bowie goes on to say, we are on the cusp of something exhilarating and terrifying at the same time. But, <laughs> but, but the point was, he totally got it. And it, like he, he puts it into context about, I'm a pop singer, so I love this, man, because like, I can get my message out, et cetera. And, but then he talks about all the things you talk about, um, Liberty. It's like sampling, putting different genres together. And like, I'm watching this and I just have to keep reminding myself, this is from 1999. And so like, I have this concept that isn't unique to me. And I got it from Bucky Fuller. People are either tuned in or not tuned in. And you can't get pe mad at people for not being tuned in yet. All you can do is try to like give them as much information to get tuned in. But it does seem to me as I'm listening to your guys' responses, like we all agree there is there uh, like you're, there's no way you're going to compel somebody to do something that they don't want to do. I completely agree with that. Liberty. You, you made me think uh, with David Bowie, another genius musician is Brian Eno. And one of his concepts is the concept of a genius. So there's a genius who's a single yes. individual, but there, then there's usually a, a genius around them, right? A, a scene, a bunch of people who are making this ground more fertile for the person to achieve what they're doing. And to me, what the internet is, it's like a civilizational, um, uh, civilizational uh, nervous system for the planet, right? And it, it can bring information from one side of the other and create a distributed genius or multiple one, right? Because because all of us, well, well, you two have met in person, but we haven't met, right? But we found each other through this nervous system, right? And a bunch of my friends I've never met in person, but some are, are in California, some are from India and Europe, everywhere. All this would not have been possible not very long ago. Everything that I do all day right now, I've learned not in school, right? I studied something completely. I've never studied anything from finance or tech. All this stuff is, is totally brand new. And the, the unimaginable part is exactly that. We're just starting to baby step around this, this new thing. And there's, there's a bunch of negative, but I think we're going to keep discovering some positive stuff. I agree. David, anything to add to there? Because I'm looking at the clock and like, I, 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 you know, you guys might become ultimately when we do the next one, you guys are going to become my first like six hour podcast. I'm just thinking, <laughs> fuck it, man. Oh, um, I'm, I'm really going to do with X3, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release the whole thing just because like these conversations, I love your idea, David. Like when we were talking about it at lunch, I just love the way your eyes lit up. And it was like, how can I use this tool? Right. And, and you start giving all these use cases. And I just love that. Right. And so 
repurpose. Like I'm sure like I was listening to um, somebody had cut up a podcast that I, the one I did with Patrick, right? And, and they'd cut it up and- I really enjoyed and, that one, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Patrick's an amazing yeah, great. host. Uh, <laughs> I, well, no, I always joke uh, that Patrick is the ideal host and uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a bad guest, though. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Patrick is is very skilled. Um, and but what they've done is they chopped it up, right? And they they had released it in like these thirty second pull quotes. Mm-hmm. And I'm listening to it. A friend sent it to me, and I'm listening to it. And they also sped my voice up. And oh. I'm listening to it, and I'm like, wow, this is this is pretty cool. And I would have never thought of doing that, right? This guy thought it was cool, so he he took the time to speed it up, release it in snippets, and like I'm like, that's really cool. So and you don't see it, as, you didn't see it as a threat. You're like, okay, maybe they only listen to the clips and they don't listen to the podcast. Who gives a shit? But I a lot of people, they a lot of people that hear the clips are going to go like, oh, that's good. Let me hear the whole conversation. Exactly. It's, and again, it's not a threat; it's a tool. Exactly. Um, Liberty's thought about the seeness. I, well, that's it's funny you use that word liberty because this has come up in dinners that I've been having with other founders in the last like two weeks over and over again, and they don't know each other. And they've asked this question about what do you think of? I thought it was Kevin Kelly. Is it who came up with the scene, the seniors term? I think Brian it was, Eno. I, who was it? Brian Eno, right? Yep. Okay, okay. I, I thought it was Kevin Kelly. So I was talking to this, like, Kevin Kelly's idea. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I actually, so I'm very skeptical when people say, oh, like this time is different because, uh, you know, history doesn't repeat, human nature does. The only thing where I'm wondering that I might be wrong, that this time might be different, is this idea of seniors is all throughout like the beginning of industries. Like it was very important that for the longest time, if you were interested in a specific industry, like if you were a young man, uh, mechanically inclined, interested in automobiles in the years 1900, you better get your ass to Detroit. Yeah, right? you need to get to Detroit. Oh, they're all there. The Dodge brothers, Henry Ford, Billy Durant, Alfred Sloan, Albert Champion. Henry Leland, they're all there and they all know each other, which is very fascinating, right? Um, you go, like you're interested in doing software uh, or making hardware. Your ass better be in California, computer hardware in the 1970s and 80s, right? You need to be in Silicon Valley. Um, if you were interested, I actually got this idea that the Enzo Ferrari is the one that crystallizes how important this idea was because the longest single book I've ever read for the podcast was actually, it's over a thousand pages. It's, an, it's a biography of Enzo Ferrari. And he said that the, the little town, he's like, why are all the greatest race cars, right? These luxury, now these are super luxury brands like Ferrari, Lamborghini, Bugatti. They're all coming from this like tiny spot. And you're like, well, how the hell is that possible? And he goes, the reason for that is the little town he was in, which is Modena or Modena. I don't know how to pronounce it, but he's like, he said a line. He goes, the people that live in this little village with me, they have a special psychosis for racing cars. And because they have the special psychosis, they have a unique set of skills that there's not anywhere else. So if you want to build the best race cars in the world, you have to be here. Eventually, Ford with Carroll Shelby, Henry Ford II, Carroll Shelby, they overtook them using, you know, a budget that was a thousand times bigger than what Ferrari had. But he's like, that's why, like, he goes, there's a, there's these places, there's a certain time in the world and certain geographical locations that, that the only skill set or the greatest people that have the skill set is there. And so I'm like, where, where do I, because I think I was like, should I be living in a different spot for like what I'm interested in? Like, I'm, I'm very interested in obviously podcasting, and talking to, to founders, like that's my main focus, right? I, I like to be other, around other founders because only founders can understand founders, right? So it's the weirdest job in the world. And so, but I'm like, for the first time in history, it might be different. Maybe the seniors is these online internet communities. And sometimes it's Twitter. Sometimes it's uh, a Discord, a private Telegram group, uh, a private WhatsApp, like all these different, like the same people are thinking the same. They're, they're trying to develop skill set in a similar direction. And yet they're not, for the first time in history, maybe co-located in one geographical location. Bingo. And that like, that, th- thus my obsession with these loose networks, thus my obsession with like, by the way, you can extend that all the way back to the first stock market uh, in London. What was the scene there? The coffee shops, right? Mm. The coffee shops served as the area where anybody who wanted to have an interest in investing this new thing. Like, how do you do this, right? Like, what are these companies doing? Where does the term carried interest come from? It comes from, that's how they used to pay the captains of the ships that would go (laughs) on these horrible 
journeys, right? And if they made it and if they were alive, they yeah. got a percentage of the profits of the goods they carried, right? So the idea of Cenus is as old as we are, right? Except the difference today is I'm in Greenwich, Connecticut. You're in Miami. You're in North America. I won't give away your location. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but Liberty's but, secret. Yeah, his, his secret. But the point is, we now have not only the ability to find each other, it's never been easier. Like, I am, in, just go to Google, right? I am interested in, boom, and you're just going to get lists of everything you mentioned, David. Like, it might be, uh, it might be your podcast. It might be um, Liberty's newsletter. It and and then you're going to be driven by your interest, but you're going to find other people who are also driven by it, and you're going to start the scenes, right? And great ideas and uh, and transformations come out of this. So it comes out of talking to each other. Like oh, I never thought about that. That's a really good idea. And and this idea that, like, I I just like. It drives me crazy when I see all these people wanting to stop, right? No, 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 no. You can't do that. It's too dangerous, right? It's it's like I used to love Nick Bostrom, and then he wrote this paper in 2019, and I'm like, oh, my God. He's like one of the smartest people in the world, and what's his conclusion? We need a totalitarian global government that that keeps people safe. That's bullshit, man. And like... He's one of the smartest guys in the world. And to read that really disappointed me. And, and maybe it's maybe I'm naive. Maybe I just have too much faith in humanity and our in, ingenuity. But like, you, why, am, why am I always banging on about David Deutsch in the beginning of Infinity? Because he does such a great job explaining. Listen, it's, and you said it, David, in, the, in a different context, but it means the same thing. It's just a better explanation, right? How do we push humanity forward better explanations right and and if you if you're gonna be like no 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 gotta gotta invoke the precautionary principle uh gotta you you can't you were talking about carnegie's dad right like yeah oh no, that's bad that's bad listen you do that what you're gonna get is stasis stasis leads to entropy leads to death life is movement that's what it is and movement is progress in terms of I never thought of that, right? And and if you if you understand that we are universal explainers and connectors, and we are going to think up new and better explanations, the future becomes something you can hardly wait to get into. Agreed. The one thing that um, is shocking to me is think about like where all the innovation, I, I, like you know, I'm heavily biased America. I grew up here. I'm going to live here forever. You know, like all the innovation in the last like two decades hasn't happened in the physical world. It's all happening online. And the reason I think about this is because the absence of gatekeepers. And so when you go back and you read the fucking crazy development, the economic development post-Civil War, right? You get that huge economic boom. You know, the, the largest economic boom in American history comes post-World War II. And just the abilities that these people had, they could literally change the world around them. They could build road, roads, bridges. Uh, skyscrapers, ships, planes, physical technology. We couldn't even make fucking masks during the pandemic. Like all we have, we've become a society of, if it's in the physical world, no. No, you cannot do it. Like that's the one thing I don't know what the solution is because the bureaucracy has just compounded over generations after generations to the point where it's like nobody was telling these people no. They're just like, oh, I, I could build a railroad. I'm going to build a railroad. Like they did it in corroborate and uh, collaboration with the government because the government would give them land grants, right? Because like, this was important. This is a network. And if we do a transportation network, then we're going to build wealth. Then they, same thing. They let them the build the telegraph lines, which is the first, you know, uh, nationwide communication network, right? Right next to the, uh, the railroad lines. Because why? Not like you get somewhere faster, that's going to increase our economic uh, ability, but also you can communicate faster. And then the internet has been this huge, huge explosion. But like, where's the physical? I feel like you know, you fly into Miami International Airport. And I'm like, this is like a third world airport. Like, this is not, you're not going to think you're in the richest country in the world. Like, why can we not build, you know, we have this thing where they're trying to build a train from Miami to Orlando. They've been talking, like, it looks like it's about to be completed, right? And it's like 15, 20 years. Like, 
these things just don't happen anymore. So that's a, you just talked about like, I really think the, the biggest threat right, is like, we have this almost like calcified foundation of gatekeepers. And it's like, yeah, that's great. We're making te- uh, leaps and bounds in, in, you know, information technology and software and AI until somebody's going to try to come in here and say, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do this. Just like they did in the real world. But like, we, we're going to have to like roll back some of this, these ideas, or it's like, we're going to have unbelievable technology in bits and like 18th century technology in atoms. That's not a life. I, that's not a world I want to live in. Totally agree. Liberty, I know you have thoughts. Uh, that's probably a two hour tangent. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll be sorry. quick, but <laughs> sorry. the ability to do large projects well is like a muscle. And in the West, our muscles have atrophied so much that, you know, you want to do anything big and And it's like, oh, okay, you wanted to build a train or a subway, it's going to cost you two billion a mile and it's going to take 20 years. And that, it doesn't have to be this way, right? And there too, we are limited by vision, right? We, we, you want to solve climate change and you want energy security? Well, you, you make a program like the French did and in 20 years, you build like 70 nuclear power plants all over the US and there it is, right? You, you just yeah. need a vision and to execute. And if you remove the roadblocks and if you do a bunch of them once in a row, you go up the learning curve and maybe the first one is expensive and takes a while, but if you do the same thing over, over and again, cut and, cut and paste, right? That's, that's how you do, that's how you get good at something and you make it cheap, but we don't have the vision. We don't have the will. It's much easier to just push the status quo and, and push it to the next guy who's going to be elected in four years and kick the can down the road. Anyway, that, that's all I said about it. So, so, so this is the note I'm going to, I'm going to stop us on because this leads to my next ask. For both of you, this is like a topic that has obsessed me for a long time. And like, I used to walk around New York City with my wife and point out things. And I would say, this fucking country used to be the greatest fucking country in the world. Look at that library. Look at that skyscraper. And you know why? Because they didn't ask anyone's permission. Mount Rushmore. Did, did, he, get, did he ask for permission? Hell no. He, he went out, he was nuts. Coolrich, if you read um, One Summer, Bill Bryson's book, One Summer America, 1927, it's like, I didn't know this. Like, Coolrich was fishing nearby, and they're like, hey, did you hear about that crazy guy who was doing the <laughs> of the parent? And he's like, no. I gotta read that. And like, I gotta read that. And, and so he goes, and like, he's looking at it, and the guy comes out, great to meet you, Mr. President. What do you think? And Coolrich is like, I think it looks great. Carry on. <laughs> Yeah. But this country used to be builders, dreamers, visionaries. They all came here. That's a completely different topic, right? Because that gets into hypomanic edge. Maybe America is different because it's where all the risk takers came. You were talking <laughs> about like the the uh, Sam Zells. Well, 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 let's let's do a Larry David arc here, and we're going to come right back to the beginning, right? So, so Sam Zell's family came here because this was where everybody wanted to be, right? And they, but more importantly, why did his family make it and their relatives not? Because of information, yes, but also because of the idea, holy shit, I'm at risk here. I don't care. Your, your ancestors, like literally yeah. swimming, To the United like, States. From Cuba, I, yeah. From the, Cuba. Are you kidding me? You're talking- That still about, happens now. Like in all those, the time. In in Miami, you'll, you'll, you'll turn on the news in Miami. It's like, they just landed in Key West. They landed in Key Biscayne. To this fucking day. Exactly. And those are the people you want to welcome with open arms. Because those are the people who are the risk takers. Those are the people who are going to, you know, make a dynamic country. Right? And so it wasn't just that, that Zell's family got the better information, obviously really important, but they also had a, a way of thinking, right? Which was, well, we're hightailing it out of here with nothing, right? Yep. And same with Carnegie, same with a lot of people. Like one of my first billionaire clients was a Chinese guy who came to this country after the, uh, his family was on the wrong side of the Chinese civil war. And oh. they literally had to hightail it out of, <laughs> out of China. And they had been quite wealthy, well-educated, et cetera. They got to this country with nothing, literally nothing. They had the clothes on their back. 
they had a bag each and that was it and yet he in this opportunity america he figured out a way to become a billionaire because he was obsessed by certain things so we've set up our next podcast you know what's the one like on espn where they have the people Patrick likes it. Sports Center, I, I know yeah, nothing. Sports Center. Sports. Sports Center. I don't sports know anything about sports. So this is going to be like Idea Center, and and you know, I I just think that it, that alone is is another two hour podcast because I think we could have a great conversation about it. So I'm gonna I've asked you both the question before, but I want to see if you come up with new answers. Like so, we we're figuring out how do you get people right? Like, and we all agreed, you can't force anyone to do anything, but. If we can incept them, if you, one of my favorite movies, um, by giving a magic microphone and you get to speak two things in it. And the next day, all 8 billion uh, humans on earth currently wake up and they think, I just had this great idea and I'm going to do, you got two, Liberty, I'm starting with you. I'm going to recycle something I mentioned, but I think it's important enough to be mentioned twice, it's the explore and create uh, framework, I guess I'll call it. And I think it's important to have both because they're self-reinforcing. I think one makes the other better and vice versa. And it, it, you get more velocity when you have both, right? So, so if people could just wake up and feel like, you know, I've been kind of stagnant. I've been kind of doing the same things. I, I need to try new things. I need to, you know, find new inputs, right? Meet new people, try new fields, go read a book about cosmology or, or evolutionary biology or, or music, right? Go read some, uh, something about back or something, right? And then make something with that. Share it with someone, write a book with your kids, write a, a sub stack, write, make some podcasts about it with some friends, right? Just even if nobody listens, there's the act of creation. It's like the act of writing, like writing is thinking. I, I, just you think you have an idea until you start to write it down, then you realize how, how little you know, right? And how many steps you were skipping and, and how many, um, right? When you know someone is going to read it, it's very different than when it's going in a drawer. So when you know someone's going to read it, you think about it much more carefully and you try to think about the counter arguments. And this. So this creation and exploration, like, go for it, man. And I'm not incepting someone. I'm incepting, and I'm trying to incept the person listening to my words right now, right? In their AirPods or something. Like, go do it. I'm talking to you. Love it. David? My first request would be find people you're interested in and read their biographies. I promise you, I really believe with every bone on my body that it, like, will, it will feed your mind and it'll nourish your soul. It doesn't have to be entrepreneurs. It can be anybody that you find interesting. Because the reason like my podcast is not called, it's called Founders and Not Companies, is because like, we identify with humans. And even if like, you don't know what it's like to be an Olympic athlete or an explorer, or a business person, or an inventor, or a scientist, it doesn't matter. You're gonna empathize and identify with their lived experience, and you're gonna be, it's remarkable how close their lived experience is going to be with you. So that's the, the first request. If you don't know where to start, start with the book that me and Jim both read and we both love, River of Doubt. It's a fantastic biography of Theodore Roosevelt. It is excellent. It, you'll get to the end of the book and you'll be fired up for life. You'll have fine ideas, you'll be like, and, Think about like one good thing about the book is like you see how struggled, like how much struggle he endured in his life. Didn't let it stop him. Kept going. Almost died on that trip. Survived. Like that inspires me. It fires me up. The second ask would be subscribe to Liberty's newsletter. I am extremely, I'm, I'm serious though. Like I am extremely myopically focused on just, I read books, I read biographies of founders, make podcasts, talk to founders. That's my like work life. Outside of that, obviously I'm spending time with my family. As soon as we get off this, I told you before, like we're going to take uh, our kids to Disney, literally getting in the car and going now. Um, but what Liberty does for me and would do for anybody who reads his newsletter, it's like he is such a fucking curious person. And he's, it's not focused on just one thing. He's got all these interesting like ideas. He surfaces so much. It's almost like, you know how popular newspapers were back in the day? It's like Liberty is like my personal newspaper because I've read it for a long time. I trust his judgment. I know he's not going to waste any of my time. And he's going to service all kinds of interesting shit. And it just saves, not only do I learn when I read it, but he saves me, I don't know, probably 100 hours a month because he's just like, here's the interesting stuff. I did the work for you. Just read this thing. So that would be my second uh, ask. I love it. And I, you, I, feel, I feel exactly the same way. Um, and that's why I'm so bullish on curation in the future. It's going to be a, like an amazing job to have for people like Liberty who are, and I love the way you put it, David. I, I hadn't thought about it that way. 
he saves me hundreds of hours a month because he Definitely. services it all. And I'm like, oh man, I'd never thought about that. So what a great one to do. And now I'm going to add one. I can because it's my podcast. Uh, <laughs> uh, li listen, my son, Patrick, made a deal with David. You can now listen to Founders Podcast for free. You have no excuses not to listen to this podcast. I never listen to podcasts twice. And the one you did with Patrick, like literally, <laughs> I texted Patrick like, who the fuck is this guy? Because, and he's like, yeah, pretty cool, huh? And I'm like, yeah. I started it again and I'm like getting obsessed. So there you go. That's what that that's how I'm going to accept our 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 viewers uh after this. And then we can come back after having time to think about that bigger question. Uh and maybe we'll just have our own little intellectual sports center. Whenever you guys want our seniors. That's good. Yeah. Our seniors, that's perfect. <laughs> Perfect. And Jim, thank, thank, thanks for the, thank, thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you for the platform. And oh, thank, thank you, you so you. much. You're just, I think what people are picking up, like what I said earlier about what Jeremy and David said, that like you're, you're a positive sum guy and like you don't give a shit if no one knows who these people are. It's like, this is cool. You should know about it. And you're constantly pushing. You do it for, you know, tons of people. So I just know because I'm in prior conversations, like your reputation is fucking fantastic and people really do like enjoy your approach to life. Well, thank you. And flattery will get you everywhere with it. <laughs> next, next time I'm in Miami, I'm buying you a really nice dinner. You could spend the restaurant. All right, guys. Oh, this is thank fantastic. you. This is all I, I look forward to this. Like my wife saw me this morning and she said, You seem very chipper. And I'm like, I'm talking to like two of my favorite people. And it's probably gonna go way over. So cheers, guys. Thank you so much for all your time. I appreciate it.